All right, dear friends, welcome here to another episode of the Personal Development Without the Fluff podcast. I am super excited for today. I have zero freaking idea what to expect today. I'm in a moment going to let this fine gentleman um, explain to you who he is because I'm not really sure myself, but I'm going to tell you how we met. Uh, we were looking for some help with some technical stuff in our business uh, through a mutual friend. He was offered as a consultant for some of the stuff we were doing with a new CRM system. Um, <laughs> and I guess I'm laughing because when people oftentimes give you like a consultant there, it's like most of us were very specialized in what we do. And Devin came in and was obviously extraordinarily knowledgeable with what we needed him for. And then, unusual to somebody who starts working for you, especially in a consulting uh, space, started kind of like branching his, his, own, in his own genius out into all these different directions about things that he saw that were holes in our business, uh, about new opportunities, plans and processes and things into, that he put into place. And I remember just getting off calls with him being like, I'm sorry, what just happened? Um, you know, because again, you're not used to people operating uh, in their kind of like zone of genius with a lot of creativity. And he just, he flourishes and does that very, very easily. So as I've gotten to know uh, Devin, I, it's very obvious that there's a, a level of genius here. Broad, broad definition there with genius. But there's a, there's a level of genius here in terms of um, like his ability to synthesize information uh, l different areas of interest from really like the mundane to like the incredibly spiritual and kind of everything in between. And honestly, I just wanted to bring him on here to showcase himself. So that's what we're here for. I'm going to let him do his own introduction and then we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. <laughs> Thanks for the kind of words there, Guy. Yeah. So introduction to Guy was like that and kind of introduction to myself is like that um, with each client as I've grown from where I've become. Very diverse background, um, very Christian upbringing. Um, my grandfather was the head of the Mennonite Brethren Conference of Canada. Um, you know, I came up in the church going to three youth groups in high school, did the sound for the travel. So just very, very devout. And that, that comes into, I think, where our conversation is going to go later and where I am now. Um, but yeah, when I came into Guy, I had just stopped bartending. I was working as a bar manager. I was also uh, working as a group fitness coach and I just stopped doing that as well. And I just started working for, like I said, one of uh, his friends and doing a lot of just technical stuff, more development stuff. But at the time, I just felt a connection to a, a greater level of intuition. Uh, so anyways, uh, I developed a, a coaching business and I just called it Devin the Coach. So you guys can check that out at devinthecoach.com. Um, it just kind of talks about how you can work with me as a business owner. And really what I'm focused on now where it's moved towards is, like Guy said, I see the systems uh, in the overall arching. Um, not that everyone doesn't. Um, it's just more, I like a broad, diverse range of backgrounds. And I really love seeking Dis, uh, disconfirming information. Well, I almost said dissing information. Uh, disconfirming information, such as, you know, I went carnivore diet for three months and then I did, you know, back to the normal thing. Then I went full vegan for three months. Just like, let's see what it is. I wasn't always like this in my past life and past iterations of myself. I've definitely been like, oh, you know, screw them. Like they're the, they're the bad camp. And that's always led down. Well, it hasn't led me to where I am now. Uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about me, but uh, yeah. I feel like Devin's the kind of guy, like you give him something that you're interested in, you kind of just like throw it at him. And uh, there's a few people I know like this where I just love asking them about any area of life because I enjoy watching how their brain processes it. It's not about agreement or disagreement. Um, like how many, how many areas of study uh, on average are you in right now, would you say? Like what, what is it that you're really interested in right now? Well, so right now I'm developing uh, myself in uh, a lot of areas and very in a rigorous self-disciplined way. And this is all actually thanks to Guy and some of the posts that they have made on Satori Prime. So uh, I was introduced or reintroduced to the concept of mystery teachings um, and magic uh, through a post that Guy had made, actually, not even working with him. Yes, I've been going through and, you know, recategorizing a bunch of their content and through that the keyword research I've seen and been in instituted into it but it basically there was something he said in a post about a phoenix that just kind of triggered something in me and it led me down a research path and that research path i just like to follow my intuition in the thread where it goes or the string as uh, a quantum <laughs> quantum physics would say but uh following that has led me into 
the understanding that all my life I've been approaching life as a magician. Um, that's with a K in the middle there after the C. Uh, and the biggest thing with that is it's a level of understanding of all things and taking your experience and paired with all the knowledge and your experience is what creates belief. Now, for the long time, I existed in the thought that I needed to have a study or scientific fact or data to prove something, mm -hmm. therefore discounting my own experience. Um, but then I've just had a lot of experiences in the recent, in the recent past, um, which is really just a memory that's led me deeper down this pathway. And then just saying, hey, what if that was true? You know, what if all of the crazy thoughts I've ever had and what if everything that, you know, I've ever felt that maybe I discounted because someone was like, oh, that's not true. Or the world says like gravity exists and that's, that's a thing, you know, it's, it's what if, what if my crazy thoughts were true? What if I actually could talk to animals? What if those times when I was a 10 year old boy in my barn working in the shop and it was pissing down rain, I'm like, man, it would be really nice if the rain would stop so I could just walk to the house and the rain just stops. And then I walk to the house and then it starts again. So embracing this and, you know, I'm only really three weeks into like a rigorous practice uh, of self-discipline. And there was a lot of different people from different camps who really shouldn't have been talking about the same thing who aren't even into magic that were putting these different um, thought leaders and authors and pieces of content in front of me that were making me draw my own conclusions to end up where I am right yeah. now. I guess. Yeah. So I wonder, I wonder about that in general. Yeah, I, I find that so often, you know, we get to talk to a lot of people, um, both clients and non, but just like people we connect with. And I'll check in, I'm like, oh, how was your weekend? Or how was your week? Oh, I was really tired. That's what everyone told me um, the last few days. Everyone was really tired. So if you're really tired, you can say, I was really tired too. And <clears throat> what that tells me is not necessarily that we're tired, is that there is like an energy moving uh through our planet or through us and we're all processing it in different ways which is maybe saying like rest now but we're so mentally used to being on the move um so i just wanted to throw that out there but what uh i actually don't know the distinction what's the distinction between the c and the k in magic uh which pardon what what's the distinction between having a c and the k in magic well so a c is the magic that the layman experiences as card tricks or as misdirection um, magic with a K refers to a practice. Um, it's a rigorous practice of self-discipline and self-mastery. And I know discipline to a lot of people can be a dirty word. And for me yeah. and my Christian upbringing, it was a dirty word for me. And I just, I, but there was a way it was written in this book called High Magic with a K by Damien Eccles, where he had just mentioned how by creating self-mastery through ritual, it helps you grow and develop and doing that. And I've already been doing meditative practices and yogic practices. Sure. And, you know, I did CrossFit to tame my body, but it was always from the Western approach that my body's a system. My brain's a part of it. My spirit's a part of it, but it's, this is the system. Then when I got into the last three weeks of development and mystery education and my understanding of string theory and developing my level of understanding of actually like Western physics, uh, then led into tree of life study. And that's where magic with a K comes in to talk about someone who basically looks and takes from everything. You're not willing to say no to anything. So it doesn't matter if it's science, doesn't matter if it's religion, doesn't matter if it's the occult. And by the way, uh, as a, as a Christian all my life, I was always told the occult was like satanic and Satanism, but occult just means hidden knowledge. Like, so it's, it's literally just the hidden parts of it. And that's where I've always been looking for that. And I had conversations with my mom growing up about faith and about things like that. And she would say to me, well, Devin, you know, my faith is a lot simpler than yours. Like, and so she would set up conversations with, you know, the leaders of the church, the deacons, the pastors about me asking why. Right. And like when I came home from college for the first time, I remember having these long hour long conversations about the introduction of psilocybin in the Bible. And at the time, I wasn't considering myself a Christian. I considered myself agnostic. And I remember these conversations finishing. I was like, well, Devin, anthropologically, you're probably right. You're very researched in this. But, you know, really, it doesn't change my faith and belief. And I was just like, remember hearing that. And I was like, well, you are in doctrine with the dogma. And that's beautiful for them. And that's yeah. their reality. And that's the truth. But to me, it always seemed like there was something missing. And now since my discovery of magic, I, so and on top of that, in that, like just to, I don't know, move the topic to wherever, um, on top of that on my level of Christianity, I'm talking about my faith and then where it is now, I guess, on the level of Christianity, I always felt a 
that there was a problem with the divination of the Bible. Uh, like scripture, there's just something about it in the English language that just didn't work for me. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and so with the understanding, and I don't, wherever you sit with this, it's your reality, but vibrations are what run everything in this universe. The power of language and the understanding of thought is actually just the vibration that's coming out of my mouth. We've put words and understanding to it at a global basis to create belief. That belief actually makes the ability for things to manifest as they are. You know, like this computer doesn't have sentience. This computer doesn't only exist because I'm staring at it and talking to it. Yep. Right. Um, yeah. So the vibrations, by changing it from Hebrew and originally as the oral tradition of Sanskrit, all those long genealogy parts that never used to make sense to me before looking at it in Hebrew and looking at the key of Solomon texts and other mystery school teachings. When you take those words, those names, and you pronounce them in Hebrew, I get the same vibrational sense that I get through a sound healing practice in yoga or from a shamanic tradition, the same feelings at the different chakra levels. Now I've always been really blessed with a current flowing through my life. So, so that's where, sorry, not just to finish that thought uh, scripture yeah. is those things when they were moved, it was about, trying to basically experiment and experience the different vibrational sounds as they move through your body, as you read that from a sacred, right. And, and that's my interpretation and that's all it is. And I don't claim that to be reality for anybody, but me, but that's, that's my interpretation. So, yeah. and to kind of flow with that, um, I've always said that there's a reason that the, there's only one wor- uh, one letter difference between the word and the world, because it's like, and God spoke and God spoke the world into existence using the word to create the world. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's a very small, you know, divination um, because of the vibrational frequency is what brought physical existence. And we continue to leverage that whether we know it or not. And it's interesting what you say about Hebrew, because the word Shalom, when you say it like, you know, Shalom and everyone for the most part knows that word, but like it has the uh, vibration of Om, just like it does in the Buddhist tradition. So it's like, oh, mm-hmm. you're, there's Om, Om in the language. And even things like um, Hebrew is interesting because it's built like a mathematical equation, right? So it's like Dam means blood, like blood in the system. And it's like Adam means uh, Adam. So it's like the blood, right? Like Adam, the original man, the blood of the original man. And then it's like Bnei Adam. So you had like, you have an Aleph, which is the first letter, Bet is the second letter. Bnei Adam means human beings or basically sons of Adam. So it's like the blood, first man, sons of the first man you know like that and and so like it's very distinct in how things are built and and the whole language is like that just like this like math equation that just replicates over and over again so i think it's it's a really interesting thing in in kabbalistic practices more than the torah well again i'm not well versed on the torah um and i'm just baseline knowledge in kabbalah but kabbalah talks a lot more about the vibration and frequencies and things that that baseline religion doesn't really talk about too much today, mostly because they have created this unfortunate distinction between, you know, the religions of the world and the, like the mystical parts of it. And the irony is I always find the people who are interested in the mystical parts are the ones who are generally more grounded, generally more happy, having extraordinary experiences, connecting more easily. And I'm not saying that's not happening with religion, but for me, it's like, uh, if we're looking at a big tapestry or a big puzzle, everyone probably has a piece of the puzzle and nobody has the entire picture. So if you look at the, in this is where my view of the actual religion of Christianity and religion in general has changed is you, you look at it where say the words often enough and the heart will follow. Mm-hmm. So for those that aren't intellectually called into the magical arts, cause it does take a level of self-discipline. Like, let's put it this way, since I've started this and in order for me to reach what we call initiation and we can talk what initiation actually means at a later for the practice I'm going about is I'm, you know, daily yogic practices, both morning and afternoon to, to create a sauna, to create balance and comfort in my body right because you need to be comfortable on top of that i'm spending at least 20 minutes in pure devotion uh every day and that's pure devotion to my inner god self to the god i believe up high in the heaven and to also devotion of another human which is my partner and helping her navigate this 144,000th plane of density um and you know you can contact me if you want to talk about that, <laughs> but uh, it, it's, and, and really it's, it's about sorting out the 22 paths in my opinion. And that's just, and that's, just, and that's what it's coming down to. And that's where 
regardless of what you're looking at, whether you ascribe to Christianity, they talk about forgiveness. The kahunas of ancient, they use forgiveness to heal. You know, you go Yahweh or Yehoveh, right? That's the same pronunciation as Yahe, which is the pronunciation in Peruvian of Ayahuasca, which is the God. There's right. too much connection between these esoteric and mystical teachings and the vibrational sounds when you remove that. So when I look at Christianity and dogma, it, it creates that ability where if you get enough people together saying the words often enough and enough of them firmly believe it, they will create and connect that current. So before I had mentioned about the current and me being blessed and my grandfather has always epitomize what it means to be the you know love thy other human christian like you know he had someone steal his car when i was growing up and he was just like i ah, guess they need it more than i do guy right. breaks into their church when computers are brand new steals all the computers he goes and finds the guy he's like no no charges i'll give him a job and give him keys to the church he just broke into wow right so like he's, uh, I remember going into, when I started getting into rave culture for a bit, as I was like walking my own path, I remember being like, yeah, grandpa, I went and did acid. I had this great experience. Like it was super like this. And he's like, oh, Devin, I know one day you're just going to find your way back to God. And I found my way back through the occult and magic, which I don't think is necessarily maybe what he envisioned, but he always knew. And when I talk about a current, I refer to intuitively starting to understand more sensory perception in your body. So I've always had a slight tingling sensation in where your third eye chakra would be or the front and as well, the crown chakra. And then it moves around based off this as I'm going deeper into it, but really, you know, in whatever mystical or esoteric practice you look at, you know, that energy feeling, that energy sensation, which can be different for everybody is real and it's there. And I would experience it during any time in worship in a church not knowing what it is to the point where as a child, when I would leave the church, I would leave with this splitting migraine from all the energy that I had taken in without oh. understanding how to charge and dissipate it. Right. Cause it was always just like this. And then I started going to a chiropractor to do it. And I didn't realize chiropractic is actually an energy medicine. And the reason why that was actually helping wasn't realigning my spine, but it was actually allowing that energy blockage right. to flow back down. Yeah. Um, it, but my parents weren't handed down that knowledge either, right? And that's just where I, we've made this fracturing as, you know, mystics or mystery schools love to use the analogy of a prism where, you know, we all come in as a single beam of light entering. And then as it splits into the visible spectrum, that's like us ending up in our levels of integration here. And we need to reconstitute ourselves. And that's kind of our mission on this realm. Um, yeah, it's a it's it's easy for me to go down and just lose my train of thought like I did there and end up uh, talking nonsense. Well, that's, <laughs> that the, no, that's, what's, that's what's funny with you. I like I like that you have. Um, well, I like that you can grab from so many disciplines, and I and I think for it makes for a more rounded discussion instead of a single narrow path that people normally walk down because humans um, were extremely inefficient at learning <laughs> and passing on what we do. Right, like to become a great doctor or whatever it might be it takes 20 30 years and by the time you're great at it maybe you've lost your motivation maybe you're not physically able to do that and then to replicate that process right again and again um we're actually fairly inefficient that's why like ai i think is like the budding evolution of humanity because it's like take all that knowledge and then grow it into perpetuity without having to restart the cycle over and over and over okay, again okay well let, let's talk about ai for a second here wait wait before, before we do that though, i want to <laughs> give pro i want to give props to your grandfather okay because yeah. I, I wish that it was propagated more in the conversation for humanity that it's okay to lose your way from God. Because mm -hmm. when you're older and you look back, you realize everybody splinters at some point in time because it's nearly impossible, especially with the mind of a child who's so optimistic and believes in all the good. And then like, we all have this like natural heartbreak that happens because life disappoints. We don't know not to create massive expectations. We think the world is good. You know, heartbreak comes and then that heartbreak leads to, well, then God must not love me because mom and dad don't love me the way that I wanted to be loved. And our interpretation of God is our relationship to our parents. So it's like, well, if they can't love me the way I want to be loved, then how can God love me the way that, and right, it's all that shit. And I, I, I splinter, like I never had a really good religious upbringing, although I did grow up in temples. I, when I was young, I spoke Hebrew. So when I came to the States, I would be the person sitting in the front of the congregation, doing the readings, bowing, doing the da, 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 it had zero connection to it. Um, and always didn't understand why people went to temple because it gave me no juice at all. Well, you're like, wow, I feel all this energy. Mm -hmm. I was not, no one was telling me about energy. So it wasn't something I looked at. Looking back now though, like you said, I have even now, it's like you speak it and it starts happening, right? Like I get, 
it's the flow of energy down the back of my spine that feels like it's like opening like this into into wings and when there's a high vibrational frequency whether it's through my personal connection to people like i'm in conversation or i'm in a space where a lot of people are in uh like like you said some kind of um divinities going on or prayer or something like that always like opens up real real big and the more that's happening the more fluid that energy is and i wondered about it for a long time but to backtrack to my previous thought was like i splintered off and if somebody had said hey that's totally okay and and it's time you're going to make your way back and that cycle took me like almost 20 years right and 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 you know also to come back to god um, whatever that definition is for anybody to come back to it, not because you were raised in a tradition, but because you've tested something in your life, have seen certain things. You're like, Oh, that's interesting. And starting to notice that that's God showing up in its own and varying, you know, uh, different ways and then coming back to it in a honest way. I yeah, wish that was yeah. more of a conversation that was available to everybody. So like props to your grandfather for giving that space. Well, and on that level, like I've seen it in circles of people that I went to high school with that stayed within the church community that, you know, went out, they got their theology degree, they did this, and I'm seeing their health literally degrade. You know, I considered myself to be the pudgy kid growing up. That was a limiting belief that I had, that I don't have flexibility, that I'm not athletic. And because I had that limiting belief about myself, I made it a reality. But then I broke that belief and I broke myself away from that. And I stopped relying on just ritual without truth and just trying to understand things to actually experience them. And all of a sudden this, and when I do go back home to visit my parents, I see the people that I used to engage with that used to be considered like athletic and busy and this, it's like, what do you do? I work, but what do you, oh, just family is, and the joy is lost, but also their physical health is just dissipating. And yeah, I'm not calling any of them out, not saying anything's wrong for them. Like everyone lives their best life. And like, I cannot stress this enough to everyone out there. There's no criticizing going on because like criticism just creates more limiting beliefs and does that one of the biggest things that actually you know and i will get to this ai talk in a second there because i know i promise on you that there um it, it one of the biggest limiting beliefs though is like criticizing others and being in critical analysis is different but you really want to stay out of that and just that openness where everything is possible um because we don't need to know just because um yeah and so, just, just, just our play on that too yeah I, I couldn't agree more i think gossiping most people um Again, they don't think they're doing it, but it, it, it's it's not helpful in both directions. Not only is it degrading the person that is being spoken of, but usually gossip is spoken of with a desire for that person to change in some way. So it's like they're, what you're talking about is what you have it you don't want, and then you have something that they do want. But the irony of the whole thing is by gossiping, you're creating a vibrational frequency and a container that that person continues to show up around you that way because you're creating that energetic container yeah. for them to show up in. So if you actually would stop the complaint, you would stop the gossiping and you would actually speak possibility. You would speak, uh, you know, creation, all that stuff. And you would just start gossiping about what you want to create for them. And without the judgment as part of that energy field, they actually would walk into that container and naturally transform into the person that you want them to show up in anyway. So it's like, we're all actually a space that people arrive into and get to show up in whatever that space provides. So if you, 200 feet. Yeah, exactly. So if you have this like limiting view and a lot of people have this, right? Like, Oh, my spouse or my partner or my friends and this and that it's like, okay, you should notice what's coming out of your mouth more often. And if you don't record yourself and you'll find out really quickly why your family and friends show up around you the way that they do. But not even that. And this is where like forgiveness comes up in all religions and mystery practices and esoteric practices. The first step is to forgive yourself and everyone around you. The Hawaiians have a very beautiful concept of it. I'm reading a book right now called Urban Shaman. And it's just like blowing my worldview up of forgiveness. And it links so much up with like the practice of Christian forgiveness as well, where letting go of all the anger and truly forgetting is this and they believe and like there's actual there's a great book called the body keeps the score as well which talks about this in the terms of western psychology and ptsd so if you want to get out of the mystics you can get the same information in that but our bodies literally trap anger as stress and tension and i'm a very tight guy like my shoulders like this is like right there that's my max range right now you know <laughs> and uh the the biggest thing is i've started doing the process of not worrying about the trauma that caused it but forgiving the anger that's held within and i started doing that when i go for bike rides uphill and i'll be starting to get sore in my legs or my quads and i'll just say out loud like i forgive whatever anger i'm trapping in there i recognize the stress like i forget and they call the emotional body coup so like, like, you know, I release you from my coup and just like, I will all of a sudden not have the pain in my quads or my calves as I'm hiking. 
Then they have this other beautiful practice of forgiveness and forgetness where you actually can go through and revisualize the incident that causes an injury or a belief and basically remove and erase the value of it. So I have like various injuries on my body like that are scarred up and I'm working this practice through and actually starting to see a reduction in the scars and a removal of it after just a week. Um, and it's, it, it's intense, right? Because I'm putting myself and I've done a lot of visualization and meditation work before this. So let's be clear, like you can't just start doing this stuff. You have to like actually visualize. And I started by taking an apple and understanding how to create that in my head, you know, and then like removing it. And after I built that visualization and like, can I understand my energy fields? And, you know, yes, I did it in a quick way, but I dive into everything full steep. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's, it's pretty incredible that what you're saying there about the forgiveness and forgetfulness, but just to, to get back to that, uh, AI there, cause this all pairs into really like, a. I mentioned the key of Solomon text before. So that's a text known as a grimoire. A uh, grimoire is one of the books, the magic books, the black magic books that the church ostracized and killed. Um, and so the belief on AI and computers is that computers are nothing more than magic made practical for the common man. You know, if you look at the internal circuitry of a computer, you look at the fact that we're using literal crystals and higher energy metals to store and transfer energy as information. Those energies are created as thought constructs in the form of computer code, which is the exact same as creating a spell and putting energy behind it and putting it outward. And it's just this really incredible thing that we have this power to do it. And like, you know, even like I see these electric bicycles going by my house all the time. It's like, damn, like we've created this ability to self power something off crystal like that man is moving up a hill based off of a crystal powered device you know a, a, like a base metal. and you know you can see the science behind it all of this but that existed before we understood the science behind it sure. right maybe we didn't harness it in this so when it comes to ai and artificial intelligence a lot of that comes down to the belief that people have of its accuracy I've seen and like seen the studies behind it and I've done it myself. The fact that just sheerly focusing on a different outcome from a random number generator or an algorithm will produce a different outcome, will cause a glitch, will change things up. And, and like that is literally working at a quantum level to affect it. So for me, for marketing, you know, I, now that I'm into magic, I put magic into everything I do where I'm putting my soul intent, energy and will, because there's a concept of mystery teaching where the will instructs the mind. So as long as my will is directed, my mind will take me and do what I need to do. And for a while, I wasn't doing that. I was going through and I was actually quantumly entangled with one of my clients, <laughs> Mike Bledsoe from The Strong Coach. And uh, I haven't said this to him yet, but I kept on creating uh, my own opportunities and products based off of what his next level of development was. So recently, they're actually having a meeting of a brain dump right now. And I was like, oh, hey, guys, I've already done like that whole thing. Here you go. Have this. And one of the coaches comes back to me. He's like, whoa, like, are you coaching people on this? I was like, eh, I'll tell you later. Like, so like, that's where like, I, I have these experiences all the time, right? And then, and it was actually another individual who was in that same realm who's been really good at calling me out for that with his business he's like Devin the last thing you did wasn't your best work I noticed this out of your scope you got scope creep going on and he said that and I did a meditative check and I was like oh wow like I'm totally producing other people's stuff right now wow and like right before I got on the show I wanted to clean up my website so it had a better offer and you get put me in touch with someone else and just all those conversations cleared up what my actual great work is right now or like the divine will for me to be following is yeah. based off of my creative genius and creating balance in the pendulum swing and it's uh yeah so that's where AI I feel it's all dictated by our thought and belief on it and like just I'll let you get in here in one second I can see the urge oh no, you got um, to the show today just, just so uh there's a, and if you want to just hear this put out in very entertainment based um the series American Gods by Neil Gaiman on Prime uh, also his novel series uh, in one of the early episodes Mr. Wednesday or like God of War he says in there or when he's on a plane he's like yeah you know Newton said that air flowing underneath causes updraft or some shit like that and now everyone believes it so now we're sitting in this metal tube that shouldn't be able to fly but it's flying and he's like well no it, it, Shadow Moon's like no it's physics and he's like yeah okay or so, some ever such shit so really put it into your mind is is do the planes fly because actual physics or did enough people start to believe it after Newton theorized it that all of a sudden that became reality. And you can look at that as a development in our physical understanding of the world. First, we say everything's made of these baser elements, you know, fire, earth, air, water. 
okay, so that's what it is. That's, that's what everything is. And then we get into the alchemical elements and the philosophical. And I think that was a great loss to our educational structure when we started viewing those as actual things. Like the fact that I was taught that an alchemist is some crazy crackpot sitting in his basement trying to make lead into gold is such a shame. <laughs> um, but, uh, oh, freezing up there, bud. Yeah, yeah I think I am. Yeah, uh, yeah so it's, uh, oh, there you're back. Yeah, so I I, it's a shame. And, uh, and that's, uh, play, so pulling it all together, I lost myself there. Sorry. You were saying about how, like, with, uh, yeah, it was my fault, a lot of it, because when I started going, you started following me. I, I actually see how your energy works. You were like a tracker, right? So you're, if, if I'm getting lost, you're going to get lost with me. But you were, uh, you were saying how, like, when a lot of people believe something like drag or airflow, that it's going to, like, be pulled into our physical manifest. Yeah, exactly. So that's where your belief has to be strong enough. And that's where when you get into these mystery teachings and education, you have to work yourself to undo, you know, your previously held beliefs, your social beliefs, your cultural beliefs, your familial beliefs, your beliefs about the human body, you know, all of these things. So you can actually develop it. And when you look at this in the term of physics, now I caught myself back on the string um, because that's where we're going. It's the string theory. Initially it was these baser elements from the baser elements. We went alchemical and then we lost the concept of philo or I was never shown the concept of the philosophy behind those alchemical uh, elements. I'm sure some people were kudos to you. I hope you are far on your development and access that other realm uh, but uh, and then from there we move to okay everything's made of particles and atoms but then we're like well no it doesn't quite always behave like that so then it's like someone says oh no wait it's got to be a wave so then all of a sudden we start getting data saying oh it's a wave and then someone's like oh no it can't be a wave it has to be something else and now they're like well we haven't proven it yet oh. but it could be it could be one of this it could be this or it could be all of it them. And then it's like, well, none of this works with math and we don't like these constants. So we're going to say it's actually probably 10 to the power of 500 different universe possibilities that exist at any given time. And in the empty space consisting between me and the computer screen is actually an infinite source of energy that I can tap into. And that's actually proven through the concept of dark energy and ether. And then if you actually take into that Isaac's laws of you know, energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but I exist in a field of infinite energy, then like, where are the possibilities? Yeah. Right. And then, so we just have this, this whole, you know, you go even, you know, further with that into our actual like brain and not talking about the conscious string, but our brains are initially thought that we only use 10% of our brains. Right. And that's what like the myth, the commonly held global myth is. Right. We actually use hundred percent of our brains. Otherwise we'd be dead if we didn't. <laughs> right. But we're actually, you know, and then the thought held though, and this is a thought that I truly believe. And this is something that Timothy Leary on LSD really theorized on and entheogenic substances that we are only aware of about five to 10% of the activity of our brain in any given second. And when we take things like LSD or psilocybin or any entheogenic substances, it basically lifts that veil. So you're able to be more sensory aware, but everyone still has a different level of sensory awareness. They allow themselves to even on those substances. Right. And that's where you get the differing levels of thought and process behind it. So it's uh, yeah, it's, it's just, there's so many life circumstances that have just always led to telling me that these are the truths. So now I'm taking it a step further and saying that everything in the world is real. I believe that there's only 3% of my DNA I've activated. I know that DNA can get activated through the use of different words and symbology and like colors. So now it's, it's just a process of like, who put the information out there first? How can I get the information? And then where is it going to take me and what's, what's going to happen? And I'm open to literally anything reality has to offer me, you know, about, a year and a half ago, two years ago, I started saying every morning, I live to 195 years old in good health. I ski, I fuck, I bike. It's not a problem. And my girlfriend thought that was crazy. <laughs> my family thinks that's crazy. But I've said it enough times that it's gone from crazy thought to real thought in me. And then it's led me down all of these paths to where I am researching magic. And even if magic isn't real, it's putting me on a level of self-discipline where I create balance. I spend my days not in awareness of the time as a prison, but that I can actually move the dilation of time on my conscious spectrum. And it's just a beautiful thing. It, it, it's not for everybody. You know, my girlfriend, for instance, it, and this is where a lot of people on this path probably hit a strife is when you're not in line with the person you spend the most time with on this stuff, but everyone's perfect in their own reality. And like, that's where her ground and her love is. And it's just the devotion. And if someone wants the knowledge, they can come and seek you out, right? 
if someone doesn't want the knowledge, it's, you know, you can talk about it because it's something interesting to talk about, but it's, it's all for everyone to live their life how they want. Right. And then that's where it leads into a new understanding of like the Christian term of heaven and hell. And back to those grimoires is I was never taught this, but back in the start of the early church, the thought of heaven was that it wasn't for everybody. It was for a select few. It was for the archangels and people who ascend and become creators versus there was the underworld. And there was a, you know, you could carve out a pretty good life for yourself down there by being buried with certain talismans and objects, but not everyone there. And it was the magicians and the angels and those that reached their divine will that were able to ascend to heaven to basically become creators or manifestors themselves. And the more I look into all the practices and religions, that's really what I am starting to understand more and view is that it, but it doesn't require a complete devotion of one's whole life. Like you still live in this material realm and live comfortably. Um, but you just develop this and it's like things like, okay, well I eat a cleaner diet. Now I, you know, practice my yoga twice a day. I make sure I move in flow. I don't miss my sessions to go out and bike and commune with nature and like tell nature how great play I'm for it. Like <laughs> it's, Again, the whole weather thing, just telling the clouds, thank you for coming. I love the fact that you're here. You're here for a purpose. Whatever you're serving is great, but I also would enjoy the sun's energy on my face right now. I've had the clouds just move out of my face and allow me and my girlfriend to sit outside on our patio when it's been kind of cold and windy. And then it gets a little cold and I'm like, close my eyes and meditate. It changes back to nice. So is it because I'm changing things? Is it because I'm looking at it differently? Did anything change? Like, and, and that's the, anyone can say whatever they want and, and I'm all good for it because belief is beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I agree with, so that's, that's a lot on a little, in a, in a short while there. I, I feel like part of my mission, my purpose on this planet is to challenge the base narrative that's on planet earth. Like it doesn't resonate with me. Like our, our story of genealogy doesn't resonate with me. I like there, there's, I feel misled and I've always felt misled because, and, and I don't know how mo more people don't, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people do how we don't feel misled when we look at, how the world is showing up and how people show up in that world because people who would feel comfortable and safe in this world would not have to act in the ways that most people tend to act because everyone's just trying to create safety all the time. It would be fascinating as a global experiment to say, hey, look, even for the next month, hey, you don't go to work till noon. And what you do with at least two hours of your morning is practices like yoga or movement or go outside in nature or whatever you connect with, but more of like, you know, practices that move energy, whether it's just shaking and doing Qigong or Tai Chi, you know, something that made people more aware of it. I do, I feel like the 21st century is the transition for even the Western mind to adopt itself to energy. And I mean, science is already doing it. And anybody who's been, you know, looking at that for a long time, going back to like Einstein and before understood all this stuff and started unraveling all these things. It's, and, and it's funny how we talk about energy and people are like, Oh yeah, that woo, woo new agey shit. And I'm like, no, bro. I'm like the, the smartest people here. I have this over here, right? Like the smartest of the smarts on planet earth. I still haven't framed this yet, but this is one of my favorite lines. Okay. Yeah, there you go. You know, if you want to find a secret to the universe, like in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration, Nikola Tesla, kind of a smart guy. I want to pay attention to what you have to say. Well, most of the physicists and quantum physicists, most of the people on the Manhattan Project are actually known hermeticists. They're known, they're known practicers of the Golden Dawn or at least educating themselves in those orders, in Da Vinci. It, when you start to actually honestly look at the people who have developed society around us and who have built everything, they've had an understanding and a belief that these practices are a big deal and are a part of it, you know, and there's speculation and conspiracy theories that surround everything. And I think that turns a lot of people off of this. Um, I know my family, like I'm very open with my family and I've said to my mom, like, Oh yeah, you're going to hear me talk about like the occult and magic. And she's like, Oh, that scares me, Devin. And I say like this, and then I rephrase things to her in the sense of like, okay, well, how about this next time you're in prayer with God, you're in devotion with them because they spend every day time in devotion with God. And you're in that scriptural prayer and you're praying. I want you to visualize God's Holy spirit, the white brilliance of God coming in and just reframe you know my kabbalistic middle pillar exercise to their understanding right yeah. leave the hebrew out of it and like she comes back and calls me she's like wow i did that and then all of a sudden this changed and it's like she's been praying all of her life right and she's had some results on this but just teaching her the concept of like harnessing and directing energy is something that's very powerful um in, in pairing things together right and where i'm going with that is is that's something i think that you know the successful people have always had and when you get about the conspiracy theories 
they could be true. They could not be true. When you get about all of the control, I honestly feel there is this, but this is something that's really resonated with me recently is that everything out of us that we hate seeing is a reflection inside each one of us. There's a, a ska song that came on randomly in my Spotify and I've listened to it in years where they have a line in it being like inside each one of us is a Nazi, a racist, a pedophile and a rapist. Right. And it's like, that is so true. And if yeah. you, if, if your family's from Germanic descent, you've ever wondered why you have certain feelings or pains or stresses in your body and like emotional things. There's a great book by a girl named Ann Miller called for your own good hidden cruelty and child rearing practices. It will give you compassion towards Nazis, no matter who you are. I'm sorry, but it will, and it will also enlighten you if you are open to understanding and viewing it as to how Hitler was able to grab such mass control so quickly of a people based off of how we raised children in that era and based off how it did this. And my lineage came across from there during the Second World War. And I wouldn't say I had a traumatic upbringing at all until I really got deeper into it. Now with a new understanding of thought, I don't believe that that trauma is actually real. And it's anyways, um, not getting into that, but it, with the whole fact, because trauma is real. So the fact that, of people who don't understand, it, it's just very little things that were done in the education practices and in the school practices. For instance, the whole thing of using the switch to, you know, get the kids and, you know, the younger generation, a lot of people, I didn't have that. I had one teacher in grade six, I think, who was still known for like, you know, being a little bit more aggressive than he should be. Yeah. Uh, but outside of that, you know, but my dad had that, my mom had that, and they were brought up on even stricter than that. Right. Sure. And even if we're not consciously aware of how we were raised between zero and seven, that's how we're going to raise our kids and treat our kids. Unless we have a large level of awareness to integrate the other 21 or nine, 20, whatever of the 22 paths you have integrated and get them into you. So yeah, it's just really a, an eye opening experience of how connected everything is and like coming into frame of like the, the Western psychology of it, the understanding of the nervous system and like how it all links and just, yeah don't discount everything be compassionate i say that to my clients all the time you know especially when they're dealing with trauma and it's something around their parents it, you know you, you can always look back and say your parents probably had it 10 to 100 times worse than they had it for you i think what a lot of people miss with with upbringing is even if their parents were physically there because of the lack of energetic um it's called education it's like parents didn't know how to show up energetically attuned. There's a difference between showing up like on a physical body and showing up with like an energetic attunement. My, my parents physically were there. They lacked an energetic attunement. And I could tell you that like my trauma is no less than no less or no more than some people have had significantly worse things happen to them in terms of upbringing, how I went to like suicidal thoughts, you know, all these kind of mm -hmm. things that we wonder about because we look at the families we're like, Oh, the family's so good and everything was that. It's like, yeah, but you don't know if that's what the child was looking at or experiencing. And like you said, most of the programming is zero to seven years old. That's like mostly precognition, mostly preverbal. Um, most of yeah. So you don't, you don't even know. And, and I find it fascinating. Like the things that even I'm still working on 20 years later, right. It, it's the same shit I started working on, but it's like, it has this lessening of an effect on my life. I spent a lot more time in alignment and energetic abundance and stuff like that. Nonetheless, it's so funny that these like memories that are so faded that I have to wonder at this point in my life, like whether I made them up to myself and it really happened that way, whether they really happened that way, does it even matter that they happened that way? And they're like, I can remember, and even that of an entire memory, I have a faded fraction of a moment of something that happened in there. And yet in a weird way, somehow it seems to like identify who we are, what our belief systems are. And it's like, you really can barely remember any of these things. And it's so interesting. So to me, it's like, if the memories are faded and we already have all the science that says like, you can't trust your memory. There's a like a 50% degradation year over year um, of that. Then the only thing that it says to me is like you said, the energy stuck in the body. You can't deal with it through psychology or personal development or mindset work alone. That stuff is helpful to raise awareness in terms of like how to have more integrity going forward and not cause more trauma to yourself. But if you think you're going to look down at your body and, and force the energy with mind to do things, I have found that um, challenging versus actually training people how to start feeling into their systems without, like you said, with, with more of like that um, practice of not having the judgment while you're looking. It's just like, honestly, really just enjoying the flow, the energy of the body, even if it's uncomfortable, but looking from a place that doesn't have the same judgments that we've had, you know, most of our lives.
Yeah, it's a, and it's a thing where you don't know. Like, I still have no idea what happened to me in that age range where I got it in, but I'm a night sweater. And I'm, when I'm in groups of people, I take on like hard sweat and I don't care like how healthy I'm being or what I'm doing, how cold the room is. I will sweat at night and I'll do this. And I'm working through this energetically right now through a different bunch of different practices on my own. Um, I, I like, like the true magician, right? He is neither apprentice nor mastered. He comes in and learns everything himself. So that's kind of always the self approach, which gives me the level I have. But, um, so with that, like there's something going on inside of myself that puts me in that state of hypervigilance whenever anyone's around to the point where now I realize I, I'm a, a very strong empath. Uh, my partner, uh, she's uh, amazing and she's into horse magic and like is this, this wonderful, like has opened my eyes up and actually without her introducing me to some topics, I wouldn't be as open to what I am now and then like developing my love and fervor for information uh, through that. But in that note, as a partner, she, she likes to sit in the, uh, we'll just say the heavy metal end of the spectrum, you know, like the death metal end of the spectrum <laughs> to go as far as it goes. And being an empath, I never realized before how much of my energy and my vibration wasn't mine. So once I started to actually like, and then why I was so called to be in these wide open spaces, I love the mountains. I love big open spaces, but I like doing it with very few people. When I go to a ski hill and there's lots of people, I don't have the same enjoyment. So I, I go out there on my own and it's really that feeling of, you know, we have a field and depending on who you talk to and the school of thought between anywhere between 50 and 150 feet around us of awareness, energetic awareness. And if you're very in tune and open to it, you could be taking on the energies of everything around you or anything around you and getting tangled up. So if you find yourself often getting irritable and you're unsure of it, it's, it's going on because of that entanglement. But it's also going on because inside of you, there's something you're not dealing with. Yeah. So in that sense, I need to go out into the mountains and get at least, you know, no one around me, 250 feet in all directions. And just like tell myself like how much I forgive everything and how grateful I am for the world and like touch the ground for a few minutes to just ground it all out. Imagine it, you know, just in a base root visualization to imagine green energy flowing out of me into the earth and rejoining itself and saying, you can return to, you know, your, your origin. Right. Yes. And sending it back. And without doing that, I end up in a state where I'm not compassionate and graceful, you know, where, where things happen in my relationship, my partner does things and I have expectations. And I'm not able to get over my equanimity to actually see past it. And then it creates friction. And in the current state of Western psychology that I was introduced to was it's all about self-esteem and getting convinced that we have low self-esteem if we let ourselves be spoken to in a certain way or if we allow certain things to happen to us because we don't set our boundaries as Western psychology calls it, I think is a very, very shitty thing. And it prevents a lot of people who really just need help and love and compassion from getting it. Because the one thing is, is it's very difficult for someone who's existing in a state of, oh fuck, or a state of fuck them, or a state of constant criticism, to, to even see outside of that. And then, you know, whether or not this, and it's not about me changing her, it's not about me getting her to do a certain thing. It's about me providing devotion towards this other human in a very beautiful, grace, compassionate way. And that doesn't mean I'm a saint. It doesn't mean I don't, I don't still look at it. But lately, yeah, like things that used to be in my brain tells me, like I will literally get a tingling sensation right up here. And this tingling sensation right up here means, yo, slow down your talk, pay attention to how she's feeling right now, because something you said just didn't resonate how you thought it did. Yes. And, and it's not telling me that I'm an idiot. It's not telling me that I'm wrong. But what used to happen was I would feel that tingle. I would continue the conversation. And then we'd end up in a fight. And then I'd be like, how did that lead to a fight? Like I used all the communication tools I have. And then I get angry. And that yep. anger would store itself in my body. And then it would move. But now I, I feel that. And I'm just like, and I sit there in sensory perception and say like, okay. And like, and, and I feel it, but I'm not, you know, and prior to going into these practices, my energetic principles used to be, which I now realize is very unhealthy, but to be imagining my aura as a bright reflective shield and severing cords. And, and I was taught that through a book and, it, you know, it kind of works, but it actually creates a negative environment. It prevents you from actually achieving forgiveness and being there. And I know some people are like, well, it's just a visualization and it's just this, but it is real. It's real to me. So it's real. And that's yeah. where you really come into play. And I just on that note, because I think a lot of people give up on visualization when they close their eyes and they don't see a vivid picture of something. Visualization doesn't mean seeing. 
visualization can be feeling, it can be sensing, it can be auditory, it can be literally nothing but you just carrying a thought and saying a single phrase in your head. If you do want bright visual visualization, one of the paths that the magician took to achieve that was through going ahead and drawing because drawing from memory requires you to think visually. So the very first step in that is choosing an object and every morning sitting in that object and staring at it for a minute, memorizing every part of it, then take it away and shut your eyes and rebuild it. Once hmm. you can rebuild it, then start to change it in your mind's eye. Then once you can do it without even looking at the object, you're ready to start moving on to other things and actually drawing that object and other objects. And you'll notice that when you start doing your meditative practice and visualization practices, that you'll actually like see what you're trying to visualize and see, and you'll get more clarity from it. Then yeah. I've coupled that with dream recall and like dream recall is one of those things where when I first started off, my first dream recall was two sets of words, shipping container, and itchy butthole. And I didn't know, and I still don't know what those mean, um, but uh, just as an incidence of like how silly it can be or whatever, I wrote them down and like, I have no meaning from it. You know, in the magical practice, you don't look back for another two right. months in the one I'm in, but it's. It, it, by just doing that, I'm getting more of a connection and recalling more. And the lower brain really works on symbology. And I'm a firm believer now that it works on symbology that we're not aware that we have in us. Because when I'm reading these ancient texts, like the grimoires and everything, I'm seeing these sigils or like, you know, basically iconography. And it's linking with me and describing certain feelings or emotional states that I really have no reason to. And it's just really, a, yeah, it's, it, it's interesting. Um, yeah, we talk about like symbology and um, what was that doctor's name? Let me look it up real quick. Uh, Dr. Emoto that did the messages yeah. from water movie. And even that, right, like the messages we send down, they take it and there are all these crystalline structures that are basically just vision sacred geometry. When, when I sat in um, silent meditation for 10 days, it's actually why I have the, the tattoo, right, of the uh, double tetrahedron is because what I started feeling was not just my feel like that I'm sitting inside the field is that all the, uh, the, the particles of my body were made out of that shape. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, as I go deeper into my system and as I go closer in, what I actually see is this imagery. And I was like, no shit, this has been used as the symbology for God for, you know, in the Hebrew texts and Indian cultures and stuff like this. And then I thought, well, what else is about this? So I started doing research and it turns out that all subatomic particles are this shape like that which creates our universe right so mm -hmm. it's like science is reflecting the same thing spirituality has for a very long time that's it's why i ultimately ended up with that on my skin um you said a lot of other interesting things there <laughs> you said a lot so i'm trying to just recap um a few things so we just do this to get it more focused next time <laughs> yeah no i mean i love i i actually what I what I wanted to bring you on here for was to people see these streams that you have. I think they're they're really really beautiful. Um, you were talking about your partner and something that um, I wanted to tell you is next time something like that happens, if you locate where your awareness is, when something like that happens, because we were talking about our parents not showing up in attunement, right? So it's like mm -hmm. here I am, physical body. I'm doing all the things that I was told to do in communication and psychology that are supportive of you. But in that moment, we're still getting like fuck. I'm not getting connection. So what's prudent is like, where's my awareness when that's happening? Because my awareness is creating something that's like an alchemy, right? That's all constantly happening between the relationship. So something I've learned in my relationship, you can try it in yours if it works, is like you drop awareness down into your hips mm -hmm. and actually like, like feel through the hips because it's like the, the man is like the support system, right? But if you think about like, where's the fulcrum in the body like where does the balance come from if your hips are out of whack like your whole body is out of whack right so it's like pelvic alignment is really important that's on the physical structure but when we're talking about energetic it's like if you want to get ground you want to get base you got to be hips or below in your mm -hmm. feet so it's like the woman and you know if we're talking about like the feminine masculine energy the feminine energy is not feeling held and balanced in that moment and the feminine is like the abstract right so it starts flowing up and like kind of going off in a lot of different directions and the man's like wait a second where did that stream come from because it it's like that communication speaks an abstraction it's where we all go for creativity we go to the feminine right it's like oh let me take my time and let me nah, nah. like dance is very creative very fluid very abstract um so it just helps to like okay cool i, I must have lost my container and the hold so you go back down to the hold that you'll see things shift in that relationship something to try well, right. And literally over 120 beats per minute of a heart rate, people start, stop hearing. 
like they stop hearing things and like that's not even necessarily just selective like while well, it is selective and there is actually like spiritual and conscious reasons to it but in, in the this western psychology if we're just getting rid of all of that it's proven that you know over that people stop hearing every word because their heart and their emotions are just so high and hot. And yeah. one thing that I do to keep myself down when I know I'm working with an individual who has the ability to run hotter, and that's a beautiful thing about her, because like you have to have swing in both directions, right? And uh, the farther you swing in one way, you'll swing just as far the other way, right? Okay. Um, it's about keeping it in the center as much as possible uh, is the key. But when you really have those experiences, you know, I can lie down on my back. There's a, yeah, I forget where I read it, but just lying on your back in an open, vulnerable position with my hands by my side as though like I'm not trying to protect anything. I'm very vulnerable. It's yeah. very hard to be vulnerable when you're in such a state. And going a step further, if I put my legs above my heart, all of a sudden, it's like it's impossible for me to hold any anger. Now, when I get up sometimes, you know, your conscious mind will start to trick you into saying like you're angry, but you're actually not. You're just remembering things that you shouldn't remember. But, and then that's a whole nother practice you can build. It's just, it's very incredible. And that's, yeah, it's just really just being open to that, that feeling and just the ability to, I guess you have to really get over that concept of the ego of expectation where, you know, really the best way to see it is see someone waiting in line. Very rarely does someone just stand and wait in line and just stare patiently or, or sit in, in quiet contemplation. You know, even when I was up until recently going to do nothing, my do nothing had a plan oh, I'm going to do nothing today. So I'm going to go and I'm going to meditate for this much time. And then I'm going to go and do this. And I'm going to go and do this. And it's like, well, that's not doing nothing. Right. I'm trying to and achieve. Mm -hmm. You're still trying to achieve. You're still trying to, you're trying to be master over your environment. Right. Yeah. And, and that's really where in order to be able to, I think, achieve full forgiveness, compassion, and grace is not schedule time and to do nothing, but be content with the world around us in complete awareness. And like awareness doesn't mean I'm thinking about being aware. Awareness just means, and this is something where I'm still, and awareness doesn't mean vigilance. Vigilance can mean awareness, but awareness doesn't mean vigilance. And I have a bad habit of switching to vigilance when I'm trying to be aware. And I think right. a lot of us do when we meditate is because we're trying to be aware, especially when you're doing environmental meditation, we're trying to be open to everything in the environment is, are you being aware or are you being vigilant, right? So, you know, and one practice I do to do that is to just be aware and vigilant is I have people that live above me and a couple with a dog over there and like it, there's another place there. So I try to visualize at any given time, like right now I'm visualizing where they are, if they're home, if they're not and this, and I might be right, I might not be right. But just by me keeping that level of awareness, not vigilance to see if they're there, but just awareness, it helps me as an empath to not walk around the world being concerned about other people's energies. Right. Cause I'm just like, there's people in my space. And as I started doing that, you know, when I was talking about biking and having that 200 foot sphere, I will be in that sphere and literally 200 feet away, you know, all of a sudden a bike that wasn't making any noise will have a click and all my attention will be drawn to it. Right. So it's like there, to me, that sphere is so real because I'm reinforced by it. Right. It doesn't even matter. Like there can be a squirrel or a chipmunk. And that gives me a moment to sit in gratitude and thankfulness and to say this. And before though, it used to be vigilance, you know? So if you find yourself sitting there and like, you know, when the door opens, you're like that, or like it's, you're in a state of vigilance. And that's where, in my conscious world during the day, I can get that away. But when I'm asleep, I can't. So when I was younger, something was going on while I was sleeping that made me hypervigilant. And my mom used to be proud of this. And sorry, mom, I'm going to rat you out for this. Um, she used to love the fact that she's like, oh, yeah, I used to vacuum on high when my kids were sleeping. And they all slept right, right through it. And it was great. And they didn't do this. Well, was I sleeping through it or was I terrified to death and too terrified and you and I couldn't get get myself out there, but I was like consciously unconscious, you know, like, and so now I've trapped inside of my body that, you know, this negative vibration because the vacuum is vibration, right, is, is, is a monster. It's something out there. It's not healthy. It's not that that loving motherly vibration that we're looking for at that age. And that's not saying anything against my mom and the moms. I know you guys have a lot to do and a very hard job and you have to sometimes vacuum when you have your kid with you and sleeping. But just as a note, like one thing I really love about the Hawaiian practice is when someone gives a criticism, it's like a curse, but that can immediately be negated by a compliment. Right. So it's like whenever anyone's critical to me now or anyone says something critical in the area, I immediately thank whatever thing they were critical towards and like kind of rebalance that energy in that queue. And I know that can sound like a very tiring process, but it's amazing the amount of energy you can leave the day with when you do that. Yeah. 
I agree. Like, yeah, the, you know, important practices we have found is like determining what me, me, not me, like what's mine, what's not mine. So it's like the more, the more vigilant, more vigilant <laughs> the more awareness you put into the body and you start feeling your energy field as the alchemy changes when other people come into your field whatever shifts happen you're like oh that's not mine and then like you said you send go back to sender right go back to source and and you have to carry around and hold it like it's your responsibility to deal with that because it never was in the first place um have you ever read the book zero limit by any chance no i haven't Okay, so Zero Limit also talks about Ho'oponopono. That's how I got introduced okay. to um, Hawaiian mysticism. And I, and I agree, because I think the fastest way to move through spirituality, if there is such a thing, um, is forgiveness and gratitude, which seems like so mundane is because you don't have to be taught those things, but that's why you know they're powerful. And uh, the, the, what's interesting about the book Zero Limit is he tracks um, a doctor who went into a, a facility with people who have like... Um, not mental disability, but who are like distraught mentally, right? Like, so like a psych ward basically. And for decades, the psych ward was completely ineffective in treating anybody. So this doctor comes in there with this knowledge of Ho'oponopono. And when he becomes the CEO, so to speak, he refuses to see patients, refuses. And what he ends up doing is he sits in his office, he takes case files, mm -hmm. uses awareness, like now I'm more aware of what he was probably doing, uses awareness to track them right in the field. And I want to just before I say the rest of it, point that the, the thing we'll probably end up finding out that moves faster than light is awareness. Mm -hmm. there, there's awareness on wherever you want it to be in the universe, and there it is. And if you've seen like Dr. Stephen Greer's uh, new documentary or like have followed his work about aliens, like they're doing meditations, basically by placing awareness somewhere where we're calling in these entities, and I'm sure they're showing up here what looks like light to us in the way that we're able to see them but it's really like their mastery of awareness and how they can locate themselves in space and time and things like this so anyway back to the story with the doctor so he sat there and he would just look at case files and he would just say i love you please forgive me you know i'm sorry thank you that kind of stuff over and over again and i think this wasn't like a year but let's say over i think a decade maybe even two decades he effectively cured everybody in this hospital. He was so effective in the practice that they closed the hospital because they no longer had patients. And it was just him sitting there and doing this energetic work with their systems versus trying to convince them of, you know, the nature of reality being different in any way. So um, I, I think there's lots of stories like that. I, one time when I was sitting in a ayahuasca ceremony a few years back and I had just read that book, I was like, oh, that'd be interesting. What if I sat here for an entire ayahuasca ceremony and I just repeated the Ho'oponopono like, a mantra over and over again so like for hours and hours and hours i just like muttered this thing under my breath and the weird part was for me about that ceremony was every time i would get to the end i would forget what the four sayings were and i'd have to go through this practice to remind myself and then say it again and then it was like groundhog's day over and over again and i was like how am i not you know just in that mindset but the funniest part is ceremony finally ends and i get to the point where i'm like okay let me look at my phone it's you know like 15 hours later I go like this and I open Facebook and the first post, first post was somebody who posted the Ho'oponopono like four mantras. And I was like, what the fucking fuck? And that stuff to me happens all the time. Like even before you were saying about directing DNA, directing our cells, like you're here, right? And you have this, this thing of awareness. Like you said, you can, even with our practices today, any teaching we start, we stop with drop, dropping into our system, dropping awareness in here. And we actually say, go use your awareness to locate everybody who's here right now. You don't need to know where they are in the world. You don't need to know anything about them. Your awareness will go and fish out these people and create an uh, alchemical co connection between everybody and start generating a group field. And within that group field, a lot more divinity will show up for each and individual person than with us saying like, okay, what are the things that we want to work on today? You know, like through our mental landscape, because we think that we have some problem instead of working with the divine timing that exists for all of us. Because there are things that certainly I like, there are habits that I would love to stop doing tomorrow or certain responses I would love to stop having, having. I've had them so many times. I'm so aware that they don't end up where I want them to end up. And yet I continue to do that. And I've had to claim a certain level of patience and grace around my own system, understanding that, that I'm not like, there's a timing to this. And I continue to, I need to continue or I get to continue to have those experiences because I haven't learned enough about them in order to truly let them go with a divine timing and intelligence that my body needs to learn and my soul and my energy needs to learn that lesson. So to say like, oh my God, I'm so traumatized. I can't believe that's happening. Instead of like, thank God these experiences are still happening for me. And they are literally on the way, not in my way. 
And I can get excited about the fact that they keep showing up instead of pissed off that they keep showing up. And to me, there is a, a fluid nature to life when we can start living in response to life <clears throat> in a way that what's uncomfortable and what's comfortable is, has an equal opportunity. And, and you can actually have joy when there is a discomfort because all the best stepping stones of your life always end, start with discomfort and end in something radically more beautiful than where it started. It's just kind of like a process of transformation. And that's the beautiful thing with magic. And that's where it is coming back around to this is the ultimate concept of magic is to take ultimate responsibility for yourself, your life and everything around you. Because when you are working towards the mastery of whatever you believe is reality, it isn't about bending the laws of nature and perverting them. It is about creating uh, the ultimate reality for yourself and, and achieving that ascension. So when you're creating that level of responsibility for yourself and everything around you, there's no way that it can't work out, you know, and like and money, money, money's a big thing, right? Money, everyone has problems with money and I'm no different from that. You know, I was a bartender, a group for this. I used to work my ass off all the time and I still like work my ass off, but in a different way and in more knowledge-based work. But I always found the harder I had to work to earn money, the farther away from my great work that I was doing. And I keep on saying this term great work. And it's a term in magic where our goal, the goal of the magical principle that I belong to, this can be different for everybody, is to have a conversation of knowledge and wisdom with our higher guardian angel. And that conversation of knowledge and wisdom can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but when you're really approaching that, it, it's access to that level of responsibility where I'm told what I need to be told and I'm following that. And that's what we call intuition, right? And science is proving now through brain scans and they're calling it something else that intuition is actually a thing. And, you know, is it proving it because there's proof for it? Are we fabricating proof ourselves and enough belief in it is making reality out of it? Who really knows? Sure. I believe that, that it's, it's a link to a higher source and your higher guardian angel and you call it the Holy spirit in, in Christianity and whatever you want to talk to and just being open to that and, and taking that responsibility. And that's where I think so many people lose it is they feel that things are out of their control and out of their responsibility. And because they're not given responsibility or they're at fault for something. And I've experienced that in work so much where it's like, I'm at fault. I'm at fault. Right. And getting on the money topic, you know, me and my girlfriend, since, from all outside perspectives, it would look like we've had a very one-sided support-based relationship where I've been doing a lot more in the sense of, of finances and work and that. But it's been to me this thing where like the only realness and reality that money has is through the threat of violence. And that's where government saying, you know, if you don't believe this is worth something, I'm going to drop a bomb on you. Essentially, it is the only reality of money. Yes, we all need money to live. And yes, we do this. But if we're approaching the world in sense of our divine will, we can't achieve ascension if we're uncomfortable. We can't, like, I can't sit and, like, yes, okay, yogis do it in the Himalayas, but, like, I know for a sure as hell a fact I'm not going to go and sit at the top of a mountain and do this. If I'm worried about after my three-day fasting experience of initiation that I come back down, I'm not going to be able to get food. Like I'm not, I'm just not going to go there. So our, our divine purpose isn't going to prevent us from achieving things. So with my partnership, you know, it, it was this issue where we'd always have, you know, she has to be building this thing and she has to get herself to a point of, of getting money. Well, now we've recently switched that to, well, what do you want to be? Not what do you want to do? And, you know, she wants to be seen and heard for her professional experience and unique ability to do this. So now instead of us creating a business where she might do coaching for people and run virtual and do all these different things business models that I could help her install and set up, it's switched to, I'm going to just tell my story and create things that I, I'm happy to create. And now all of a sudden, things are a lot better in our house, in our relationship. I have more opportunities coming in. People are very receptive to everything. And like, yeah, you could say that's my energetic work. That's this. It's all my forgiveness. It's all these, it is, it's all these things on top yeah. of them. It's never any one thing. It's and chicken, that's it's chicken or the egg. You know, it's like, it's like so funny the, the the thing that people are looking for is the paradox at all time it's like it's like it really is the point where the two meet it's never one or the other it's this like complementary of the two coexisting and it's like it's tough to say it's like are these opportunities showing up because i've done the work or or are they here because it's allowing me for to, to do that work and i agree like we we use money as a me as a system of measurement but money is energy it's an exchange energy and uh, 
at the end of the day, all I've seen with money do is just magnify characteristics that already have people already have. Mm -hmm. So I look at it as a magnification energy. It's like, if you're an asshole, you'll get a lot of money. You're going to become a much bigger fucking asshole. And people are like, well, you know, I'll be generous when I have money. I'm like, you won't unless you're generous now and then money will make you a lot more generous because you'll have more resources and like you'll have this flow that's coming through you and money will show up so that you can keep moving the energy energy likes to move and it's looking for systems that allow for energy to move so i like to think of god as like you know this energy that's like flying overhead and where all these antennas walking around but most people's antennas are like bent to shit and are you know been bent this way and that way and if everybody remembers the old am fm radio stations right you're like turning the dial and get that static and then you like land on a station but if the antenna is bent you never land on a station or you hear like a word here and a word there you like if we even think about the chakra systems it's like and they're mis there's misalignment there then it's like the light energy is trying to come through the prism right like you said mm -hmm. but it can't come down through it cleanly so it's just refracting in all these directions and then you don't have this focused energy you need the energy to hit the bottom chakra because that just like our genitalia is the creation energy that exists in the body so if that can't get entrained with energy you're you're already limited, right? And it doesn't matter in what principles you look this from. It it seems to be true. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, and the, well, the funny thing is, is that when you talk energy systems are like the, the simplest systems in the world, but we've made them the most complicated, right? In the sense where we're changing things, and, and we've changed things so drastically through all of our. our that where, you know, you might have, you know, clockwise, counterclockwise rotation, your wheels of life spinning in a different, your cob and like, there's truth to all these energy systems and all of these different practices and where they are. So now it's about discovering where each one of you are. And I think because we're so used to saying like, we need a doctor or we need a healer or we need something like this. People aren't even in a state of willing to, and no one, I haven't seen anyone showing it. I've kind of discovered it on my own through some books that I would have never picked up, but just following intuition to actually like sensing the rotation of my chakras and like, and then like, okay, well, how can I change it? I'm just going to share my screen real yeah, quick here. So this is, this is um, the Hebrew calendar and you probably the, the Yitzhak or I'm probably mispronouncing that. Um, so and just, that, and just describe it for people who are as best as you can for people who are listening. Yeah. So at, at a base level, these represent the 231 days in the calendar year and the connection between each day. But the reason why I'm showing this is this was shown to me in a teaching by someone and they said to focus on this. And immediately when it was shown to me, the center of it connected with energy to my third eye. And I felt a tingling sensation there and the wheel started to turn. And it started to turn very slow. And this is before the person running the guided meditation on this even said anything. And then they told, said about the spin having to be clockwise and how that spin dictates positive or negative. And if you're spinning it counterclockwise, you're going negative. And then when you look in the Eastern mysticisms as well of chakras, it's clockwise spin is healthy spin. Then you look at chirality of atoms, clockwise spin is healthy spin. So when someone shows me a mandala like this and I feel an energetic connection and then I actually see it do the thing that someone then tells me it's supposed to be doing it makes me know it, it's this and it gives me now an into it gives me proof that I have the ability to heal myself you know that I have the ability to do this okay so if this works for me then that means that I can also do these other energetic practices and therefore it gives purpose to me spending my time in study it gives purpose to me spending my time in meditation beyond just this is something I do because it's healthy right and I'm not doing this to heal myself I'm doing this just to achieve that next level of potential yeah, it, it, it's what I find over and over again is the more effort that's applied, the less that happens. Mm -hmm. Again, it's like this weird paradox. And because we've, we've, we've been trained to, through the narrative, to believe that achievement's the most important thing, it requires a lot of your effort and energy to achieve. And think about how many people are tired or their bodies are breaking down. It's because you said there's like, there's too much output and there's too much processing. There's not enough rest and digest, right? What, again, science is starting to catch up to these principles, parasympathetic, they're learning through, uh, you know, studying the brain and stuff like this. But again, we've known all these things for thousands of fucking years. And it's like, hey, guys, we've already produced Christs. We've produced Buddhas over and over again. Those people still exist on the planet Earth today. They're not as well marketed as some of the other ones that we know. Nonetheless, like, People like this exist all the time. So it's like the template is made, right? The templates for consciousness, Ken Wilber's work, like we know a lot about awareness and consciousness and how things like this work. It's not a wheel that needs to be reinvented over and over again by every generation, except we are, it feels like we're stuck on the units of measure. 
from from one generation to the next you know like a few years ago my brother and i stopped um we used to goal set oh december 31st what do we want to create next year yeah. right all done and and i agree like at the end of the year and we were terrible at this we would write it down one time i would never fucking look at it again but the next year on december 31st i would look what we what we wrote down the year before and every year 80 to 90 percent of those things came to pass like yeah. it's just it's, it's energy it's intention it's will it's all those things but what I realized was it also creates a lot of expectations and then there's an effort to produce and that might be way more limiting than you realize because suddenly instead of a really wide field, you're very narrow field into which things can come through. They need to look a certain way for you to identify them. So we were like, fuck it, you know, like, well, how would we shift that? Well, the shift for us was goals became more about our emotional and feeling experience like how do i want to feel next year mm -hmm. right and it's like and everything that doesn't feel like that is something worth getting curious about not something worth devast getting devastated about not something worth uh, trying to understand like most of my clients that they come to me they're like the best thing you taught me is to get curious and be interested mm -hmm. instead of constantly being at the effect of needing to understand because that, that, that needing to understand it's like you're, what you're actually looking for is a false feeling of safety that's going to be taken away from you the moment something changes outside of your plan and your expectation. So you might as well turn yourself into a much more malleable person that, like you said, when somebody shows up in our space and we're like, I don't like that quality about them. I want them to change. This fucking nothing to do with them. That's a quality you haven't become hol holistic within yourself. Because if like, you're like, Hey, look, I don't like my anger. I don't like when people show up angry around me. We don't think to ourselves, I don't like my anger. We think I don't like their fucking anger, right? But if you started diving deep into every time you got uncomfortable around your anger and you brought more uh, love into that space, more forgiveness into that space, anybody who showed up around with you with anger, all you'd have is empathy because you, you, you would see that they're stuck. You wouldn't see that they're doing something to you. Why do you have to take on their emotions? Why can't you affect them? That's, that, that's, that, that's a driving principle. Why is it that, that something negative in our sphere and these positivity police, I call them, <laughs> why is it that the positivity police running around are like no negativity in my sphere? It's like, if you're that positive and you're that light of energy, shouldn't your vibrational frequency be able to affect those around you? And then therefore, shouldn't you be able to like empathically change that? And that's the concept of like tapping. Um, yeah. Linda Tellington Jones with horses uses it and you can really use it to connect yourself back and body the Hawaiians use it in the same tradition we were talking about before and so many doing even really like as a base level like if you just lie down on your chest and just lightly tap like this here it actually stimulates the thalamus gland which stimulates your your immune system so if you're achieving colds and this and if you do that for a little while while lying down I experience you may as well a vibration that emanates through your chest and your whole body um, after doing it for, you know, several minutes. Uh, and it's just really, you know, it's a practice that I've started. And since then, my allergies have been reduced, my quality of life. Yeah, so it's a really, really wonderful thing. It's... I wrote this, I wrote this uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, it's like, uh, can you see that? I don't know if it's on the screen. Yeah, the, the outside yeah. world doesn't have to dictate your inside world, right? It's, I, th I feel like that's probably the, one of the most powerful things we can be a As study of. As outside, so within. Huh? Yeah, As exactly. outside, so within. So the outside world is going to be a hologramic, uh, like a hologram reflection of the inside vibration within you. You you were talking about crystals, and we should eventually wrap up because me and you could do this for 16 hours, I'm sure. Um, and uh, I thought I was, thought that was very interesting. I think a few years ago I read that a millimeter, like a square millimeter, and I could be wrong about this. That's about, you know, basically, so it's called like a yeah millimeter squared, um, like you know, approximately a little bit thicker than hair could store approximately 300 trillion bytes of information. So it's like 300 tetrabytes of information on like that piece and add like a half-life of, I don't know, 100 million or some absurd amount of time. And I was like, oh, is that really interesting? And you start thinking about how like the, the whole planet is this organism and we, we think we're perceiving minerals, but it's really just a storehouse of information, right? And so I like to think about like, what is it that we're creating? that's a replication of spirituality that's coming outside of ourselves that could be within ourselves. And we have, you know, devices and computers and terminals. And I like to think of humans as terminals. And before it's like the terminal had a hard drive on it and that hard drive had a limited amount of space. So just like a human with a certain brain where you keep inundating it with information and you keep putting stuff inside of it, you actually confuse the system to the point where it's like when your hard drive has very little memory on it, everything slows the fuck down, things get confusing in there, the RAM is not enough, right? 
So we like upgraded that system and we made cloud computing, right? It's like, oh, there's the all, there's the internet. And then suddenly we stopped getting into this race about always putting more memory and always more speed into the computers because it's like, oh no, we could actually work with the speed that we have and actually do a lot more as long as the data is not being kept on the disk. But then you got to teach the terminal how to go get the information from the storehouse. So I, you know, I know this is, there's like Akashic records and, you know, sole storehouse of information. And so what, what I find is the more I clear my system out, the more I learn to connect up and out and in all really all direction, because there's resource for us below, there's resource for us above, there's resource in the air, like there's just resource everywhere. It, it really does take, like you said, um, quieting the system. I never heard that 120 beats per minute. That's a cool thing. Like lowering all that down so you could hear. The, the first thing I wrote when this whole pandemic thing started was the world's about to get a lot quieter. It means you're going to be able to hear a lot more because it's like, we've made it so noisy. We, it's like, we're so fucking retarded that like our entire environment right now has been created to take us away from the one thing that really matters to all of us. And we keep creating environments that make it less successful or less opportunistic to actually pursue the awakening of of man um so it's like in a weird way we've created all this technology that in certain facets could propagate this information to everybody and help everybody get on this you know get to a point where they're um in study and really doing the things that matter to us all and in a lot of ways it's it's taking away from that i i saw this moment as an opportunity in time for everybody to slow down and and hopefully pursue those practices a lot more. And I hope for a lot of people that was the case. Um, well, also clean out their energy fields, right? Because like six feet or like the social distancing social norm distancing. that people have given is actually what our current science says it like it tests the heart field at, it tests our EMF range at for people who have that level of sensory awareness. So we're literally giving the, the awareness globally with the global like consent, like the, everyone just said, yeah, okay, pretty well. You know, no one really like I've, again, I don't watch the news because I think a lot of the news is created as a reflection of ourselves and everyone else in society. And yes. I try not to reflect everyone. So I don't want to put that into my belief space all the time. And people would call that willful ignorance. I just call it choosing my filters very wisely. Um, you know, and, and yeah, so my algorithm is different in my brain, but yeah. really like it's, yeah, that's what you're saying. It's just, it's, and that's where I really think people need to understand that just connection is everything. And there's no way that, anyone can tell me in my level of reality that the Kabbalistic teachings and their formation and their understanding and the similarities between that and the Hawaiians, the similarities between that and the shamans and the ayahuasca. And then you take that to the fact that Francis Alexander Crick, the fellow who won the Nobel prize for theorizing the helix form of DNA used to microdose LSD in his study. And he says and claims, and I could be wrong on this. It's something that I read somewhere on the internet that I thought was scholarly black. So if I'm wrong, someone please correct me. But, and I'd like to believe this, if it, and I do believe it is true, but he theorized this form and came to him on an LSD trip, right? The same states that we've reached in meditative principles and we're shown the Kabbalistic tree. Like everything is just like you said before, we're just taking the same thing, putting new symbology over top of it. If we can just get over ourselves and say, hey, listen, this might be true, this might not be true, because guess what? We remove our expectations. When we open ourselves to the belief that everything is possible, you don't have expectations. If you don't have expectations, your ego is less engaged. If your ego is less engaged, you have less hate. If you have less hate, you have less anger. If you have less anger, you have less stress. If you have less stress, you... And so, you know, just, just discover people. And it, on, you know, because I do, yeah, see that we want to go, but I just want to touch on an initiation. Sure. sure. Because we often think that we need to know things before we do them. And I was like that for a long time. Tell me the result and then I'll do it. Tell me what I'm going to get out of it. It's what we tell people in copywriting to do. It's what we tell people in marketing to do. There is the process of initiation refers to you go and do this and go through the study and you will experience and have the revelation. And I've spent a lot of time in my younger days studying the Bible and also the Vedic texts and different points in my life. But until I had, and I don't even know what the key was, but a specific piece of information, I was initiated properly and re went through reading this. Did I actually see like the truth behind it? And some of it is just impossible to actually share verbally to someone so. yes Im no impossibility 
like uh, Osho is quoted saying, he goes, a teacher doesn't tell you what to see, a teacher shows you where to look. You started this whole conversation by saying, I'm learning to direct experience. The last three, four years, the same thing for me, right? Look, there, there's a point where you wanna be led and certain frameworks are helpful for guiding the mind out of some really troublesome frameworks that, that the narrative on the planet today is creating. That, and, and it's really unconscious. Like I said, your parents got it passed down. There was a narrative before about like, do children have to be obedient? Like there's ownership over a, a human life in any way, shape or form. Now it's like that, that shift is happening. Like our education took a hard right turn with our clients to direct experience. What I find now is because I don't have to explain anything to them and I release them of that burden of the need to understand. I basically point at energetic practices and I'm not saying, and I'm not pointing at things that they need to develop. I'm pointing at things that they're already doing. They're just not even aware that they're doing them. Mm -hmm. So by, sh by showing them, it makes the stream wider because I'm like, Hey, look, that's where it's already at play that quick. They're like, boom, they drop in. And so things that used to take sometimes years to get to in terms of understanding happen sometimes within days, weeks, or months, depending on, you know, people's varying experiences because they're getting a direct taste. No one could, no one could tell you what a strawberry tastes like by explaining it to you. You got to put that thing in your mouth. You got to take a bite. And if, when you're really present, you're going to start noticing a nuance. And this is true for even food that you eat on a regular basis. Now you even forgot how it tastes, but if you slow down and you really like actually brought sensuality, the energy of sensuality to it, and you start getting bliss, every fruit, every piece you'd eat would be a level of appreciation and a direct experience that would actually open something up in your system. So now, it used to be like that the education was about informing the mind how to see things differently so that you can change the bodily experience. But if you have a direct experience, you're changing your vibrational frequency. And if what's inside will show you what's outside, then change your vibrational frequency. And then you'll see that the world and people start interacting with you differently. Reality will show up differently. Now reality is showing up differently. And because you're living in a reality, you're like, that's interesting. That, that part that that's interesting will start reinforming the mind about the truths of reality, right? Like all the ancient texts, people didn't sit around. They're like, let's ponder about God. They, they sat around silently, like the, the, I think the Vedas, right? The, and all that stuff. It was through silent practice. I could tell you, I learned more about the cosmos sitting in 10 days of meditation than I ever did by picking up a book about astrology. Yeah. So my magical initiation practice, and this is just through reading and myself and not part of a group, uh, but the group is called if they're still around and someone wants to reach out to me to say this, I'd love to hear more about the greater brotherhood of God. And it's 60 days of straight dream recall with a few meditative practices. And after those 60 days, I go for a three day initiation, right? With fasting and silence, no one around, uh, no devices. I'm going to do mine up in the mountains where I find the most devotion in a bivy sack. Um, and every hour for eight hours, you repeat the same meditative, right? Um, and after that you do it, but you can't until you've built that level of visualization. And as I'm going through starting this dream recall now, I can understand why, because the level of depth of understanding that I gain, even in my morning study and reading, uh, is just continually just growth. And, you know, you just, you, you see the links in the symbology, you know, it's, it, it's really huge. It, it's, uh, I, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's really crazy. And anyone, you know, if you're curious about this guys and you're looking for self-study, wanting to finish on the books, you reach out to me. I'm sure guy can put you in line with that. Um, it, it's just about learning discipline and responsibility in a very healthy way. You know, yeah. discipline isn't a prison, right? It definitely is not. It's cause it, it's like you said, it's devotion, right? It's a, it's a practice to something every single day. The more I've been around indigenous cultures and seen how they treat everything ceremoniously, mm -hmm. Um, you realize we're not we're not in awe of our lives because we don't we don't live in a ceremonial state. We take everything for granted, where it's like everything that you do from eating food to brushing your teeth to washing the dishes can be done with a level of devotion inside a ceremony. I'm not saying I practice that all the time, but certainly I'm I'm much more aware of these days where where is my awareness while I'm doing this thing? If you're in a complaint, I could tell you where your awareness is not you know and where yeah so well grandma's yeah. food always tastes better right her awareness and prayer was on you as she was making that that's why whenever i'm home i i, I any dietary restrictions i had and anything like that whenever i'm home i visit grandma and i let her cook for me because it's not even just so much about the food and like she hates that she has a small kitchen now and her carpal doesn't let her cook the way she used to at like 90 something and so like but age is just enough she's been around for a long time it's yeah. that it's that prayer that intent into it right and that energy and that's exactly what you're saying it's just like 
like you got to just like, you know, you got to put that intent into it, that prayer. It really matters. It really, yeah. really matters. Yeah. Present, present. There's an incredible power with presence that we are scraping the surface of and it goes extreme, extraordinarily deep um, that I think most people are unfortunately not exploring or getting interested about uh, unfortunate or not. I don't know. Like I, yeah, I, I'll leave it at that. Again, I know we could talk for hours. Um, if someone was going to reach out to you, what would they reach out to you for right now? Yeah. So, well, uh, you can go to Devin, the um, at, if you go right now, there won't be a contact form on there. So you can find me on Instagram, uh, to contact me, but, uh, you can reach out for me for any of the topics we discussed here. I follow my intuition uh, and go from there. Uh, I do feel that eventually some kind of magical coaching vibrational energy will come into my space. Uh, currently though, I'm mainly helping entrepreneurs and business owners from, uh, mid to growing companies achieve better marketing, predictable profits through using systems approach. And as guys said, it's just that overall view, uh, that I bring to the table for strategy. So Devin, the coach.com and, uh, or find me on Instagram or Facebook. I'm not yeah. that active right now, but who knows when I will be. Yeah. And I would just say like Devin said, and we've been talking about a lot here is like follow your intuition. I know when we first had our conversation and we were considering hiring you, I was, I was like, I, I know when I'm a yes, like I'm always like, okay, I, I do want to do this thing. And I, and I always remove the money consideration first. And then I say, okay, let, I'm gonna, if I'm a yes, then if the universe reflects that yes this next week, then I'll take action on it, basically. That's how it works for me. And then a whole bunch of shit happened that week that I was like, okay, I guess we're working with Devin, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's not even up to me. I'm just looking for clues whether or not that's in alignment with what's going on in my life. So if you guys are listening to this and, you know, you're resonating, I, I would say less with the content and more with the vibration of this man. Like, I've been in the marketing industry for nine years. Devin is one of the most fascinating, interesting minds and energy that I've been around maybe this entire time and you could tell even by the level and speed at which things are coming out of his mouth and how many different disciplines he's synthesizing at one time there's like an extraordinary level of genius uh that i really appreciate about you my brother and like i'm so excited because i feel like we're pretty early on in our path together and there's like a lot i could of never do it without your belief in my genius and that's the biggest thing so and i want people to be clear on this and, and i hold that in the highest regard because people like guy because people like my mom and my dad and i know it sounds kind of like oh to say but because they believe in my genius i'm able to access this genius and because i believe i have access to all the wisdom i don't know when i gained this belief but i had this belief ages ago where once someone thinks of something everyone has access to it. And string theory is kind of starting to prove that in consciousness. So I've always lived there and I've had many times, even in conversation with Guy in the lawn where something comes out and I'm like, where the hell did that come from? Right. I, I don't remember reading that or like, it's this crazy thing. So regardless of what you're doing, reach out to me. And I made the joke before about not posting on Instagram is because I, since I've started this business, I initially started this being like, yeah, I'm going to market and I'm a marketer and doing this. I haven't had the need or the ability to complete my website or start doing my social media because I'm working in such a will that people just keep on referring me to people and they keep on giving me that power and doing this. So really guys go out there, follow your intuition. Um, and if your intuition is to reach out to either me or guy for anything, even if it's not something we talk about on our sites, like get an answer back. You never know where it's going to lead. So totally. I couldn't agree more. All right, my friend, thank you for being here. Love you very much. Well, love you Appreciate so much. guy. Have a good one. Thank you so much. For